So why don't we get started? Um, just like to welcome uh, everybody back um, to our conference on uh, prejudice and stigma. Um, the afternoon panel is going to focus on um, um, empirics and measurement broadly defined, recognizing there's not uh, uh, there's only a fuzzy uh, a fuzzy distinction um, between empirics and theory uh, between the two panels. Um, I don't have much to add beyond uh, Stephen's uh, opening remarks, other than to just reiterate our gratitude to all of the panelists and also to our sponsors, um, the HCEO and community on uh, quantitative methods. And we've got uh, four uh, uh, panelists slated to speak. So I think we should uh, get right into it. So we have plenty of time for um, questions and comments. Uh, first, uh, we have speaking uh, Dr. Michael Gaddis, who is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of California, Los Angeles, and a faculty fellow uh, with the Center, California Center for Population Research. Um, uh, his work focuses on racial discrimination, uh, educational inequality, and mental health. And um, he's examined, um, you know, both the levels uh, and also the conditions under which racial discrimination occurs in, in um, different contexts. Uh, a couple of years ago, he published a book on uh, experimental methods um, used to investigate discrimination titled uh, Audit Studies. Um, behind the scenes with theory, method, and nuance. Um, so thanks so much for joining us, Michael. You can take it away. All right, so thank you all. I'm excited and honored to be presenting on this panel. Um, today, I'm gonna add to this conversation by discussing what we know about signaling race and ethnicity in survey and field experiments. Um, so first, let me acknowledge some of my own work I draw upon for this talk, so you can find it if you're interested in learning more. Um, there's two published papers that I'll be talking about, two working papers that you can find on the Social Science Research Network, um, the book that Jeff talked about, it was published in 2018. Um, and then there's some updated information on my website on the, what we're calling the Auditing Audit Studies Project, which includes a postdoc Edward Larson from the University of Oslo. So thousands of survey and field experiments, as well as vignettes in interviews and focus groups have used names to signal a number of characteristics. These characteristics include age, gender, race, and ethnicity, immigrant generational status, SES, and social class. Studies using names as signals span a wide array of disciplines and topics, including economics, sociology, political science, psychology, management, and others. Scholars often intentionally signal race and ethnicity in research examining racial inequality, prejudice, and discrimination to avoid social desirability bias and maintain high internal and external validity. In survey experiments, names may help a researcher hide the intention of the research. For example, rather than describing someone in a vignette as a black man, a researcher might instead choose to simply call him Jamal Washington this may help reduce or avoid treatment discovery while still accomplishing the same goal of signaling race. In field experiments, names may be the best or the only way of signaling race in re sorry, real world scenarios such as applying to jobs or emailing politicians. However, in choosing an indirect signal of race such as a name, researchers may be unintentionally signaling other characteristics such as immigrant generational status or class. Prior work has raised this point. In their now classic correspondence audit, Bertrand and Mullenathan examined correlations between response rates in their field experiment and mother's education from birth record data for the names that they used. They found no evidence that demographic class data predicted the response rates in their study. A second famous study by Fryer and Levitt used birth record data from California and found that black names or those <laughs> given more often by black mothers were associated with lower income zip codes and lower levels of parental education. Two other studies um, suggest that names may at a minimum signal both race and class to employers in the first case and teachers in the second. Actually, that's reversed. So multiple questions are pertinent to our understanding of racial inequality and in particular, some of the methods we use to examine racial issues such as prejudice and discrimination. So first, do people perceive race and ethnicity from names in the ways that researchers intend? 
The answer to this question may shape our understanding of research results. For example, unclear race signals may lead field experiments to underestimate true levels of racial discrimination. Second, do racialized names signal other unintended characteristics? The, result, the answer to this question may also shape our understanding of research results. For example, some studies may actually be estimating class and racial discrimination together and thus overestimate true levels of racial discrimination. So here's a simple visualization. In 2013, Doliak and Stein conducted a correspondence audit of local classified markets by posting ads selling iPods. Rather than using names to signal race, they used the skin tone of a hand in each picture. This is perhaps a, clear, a cleaner signal overall with higher internal validity, but it's not something researchers can often do. Instead, most field and survey experiments look something like this. Here, race is signaled through names at the bottom of an email. However, what percentage of subjects read Shanice Washington as a black woman? Moreover, what percentage of subjects read class or other cues from Shanice's name that the researchers didn't intend? An examination of Bertrand and Melanathan's 2004 results may provide a clue. So despite random assignment of names and other characteristics to resumes, the response rates within race by name exhibit significant variation, as you can see here. And the, the blue dots are the individual names that they used, and the red uh, diamonds indicate the average uh, response rate for each race. Now, in fact, name selection played an important part in determining whether this research showed discrimination against Black job seekers. With a different set of names, the conclusion would have been drastically different. So if there were about a handful of white names and roughly a third to half of the uh, Black names had, had changed, then we might have found no discrimination in this study. In correspondence audits in particular, researchers seem to assume a, consistent, a consensus of what constitutes distinctively Black and white names, and that any one Black name should yield similar results as any other Black name. However, scientific explanations of how researchers select black and white names are woefully lacking. In my own examination of the correspondence audit literature, I find that less than or fewer than one out of every five studies using names to signal race have scientifically examined relevant data to see how people perceive race from the names they use. When researchers do gauge racial perceptions uh, using pretests, they often have very small sample sizes and or only use college students. This is particularly troubling because named-based correspondence audits have become the leading method of providing evidence of racial discrimination. But as I said before, these are also used in a variety of other kinds of studies across many disciplines. So today I'm gonna to show you results from a number of data sources examining this issue. First, I examine respondents' perceptions of race from names using survey experiments. I select and code the names used in this work from New York State birth record data on mothers, race, and education, US census data on frequently occurring names, and existing correspondence audits on race in the US. Um, to, to put it simply, what I do here is I take the birth record data from New York State along with the existing audit data to select first names, those that were used in previous audits, um, for which I also have data on, at least in New York, how frequently um, those names are associated with Black mothers and the education level of those Black mothers. And then I use census data to select last names so that I'm selecting last names that are um, uh, either highly used by um, whites only in the US or Blacks only in the US. Uh, and so next I will uh, briefly discuss the results from a similar survey experiment looking at immigrant generational status. And then finally, I'm going to present some preliminary work examining how name selection influences findings on discrimination from prior field experiments. So for brevity, I'm not going to discuss all the details of this, but I'm happy to talk more in Q&A or outside the conference. So in this first uh, data set, um, I have about 9,000 respondents who were randomly assigned to one of 10 sets of 20 names. So there's 200 total names that I examined the perceptions from. That's 80 black names, 80 white names, and 40 Hispanic names. And respondents are randomly assigned to either a condition where they look at first names only with no last names. Um, and that might be Jamal and Washington, uh, sorry, Jamal and Michael. Uh, first names and last names where they're matched racially. So that would be Jamal Washington and Michael Decker. 
or they're matched, uh, they're mismatched by last name. So that would be Jamal Decker and Michael Washington. And so the idea here is to figure out how much the first names matter, but also how much different combinations of last names might matter because researchers haven't really explained how they choose last names either. And then finally, um, the respondents beyond uh, uh, answering a host of demographic characteristics are asked to identify the race ethnicity they associate with each name. This is an open-ended question um, to allow for some more flexibility and um, they're provided some examples in case they don't know what race and ethnicity might mean here. Um, so this is a full set of, of the names that I use and um, the, well, this doesn't include the Hispanic names. So for brevity, I'm gonna uh, not always show Hispanic results, but I'll talk a little bit about the overall findings. Um, the yellow names are the black names and the blue names are the white names. Uh, and you can see that based on the New York State birth record data, there's some variation in um, class characteristics. And so I know this is hard to see, but you're not supposed to look at individual lines as much as the overall pattern. So this is the full set of white names that I tested. And the green lines are telling you the, the um, percentage of people that responded that this name is white when there is a black last name included. The red lines show when a white last name is included and the blue lines show when no last name is included. So a quick takeaway is that adding a white last name over no last name or instead of a black last name seems to make a huge difference in the percentage of people saying that a name is white. And what you can really tell is that other than maybe uh, a dozen or so names, um, the rest of these names, 90% of the time people see these names as white. Here's the same results for black names. And uh, the red line now indicates that a black last name was included. So what you can see here is that there's a lot more variation in what people think of quote unquote black names period. So that um, a name like Deshaun, which is up here at the highest perception rate when you include a last name is almost universally seen as black. But there are some names down here at the bottom including Jasmine, uh, Reginald, Octavia, Jalen, which are coming in at 70% uh, or less of uh, people seeing that as a black name, even when coupled when, with a last name like Washington. For Hispanics, the pattern is um, honestly just sort of insane because uh, no matter what, if you include a Hispanic last name with a Hispanic first name, more than 90% of people are seeing these names as, uh, are suggesting these names are Hispanic or, or Latino. And um, to me, this suggests that uh, these names are, it's, it's very easy to use these names to signal ethnicity um, if that was your purpose in a study. So this is what the um, logistic regression results look like. So this is for white, uh, white first names only. And a couple of key things I want to point out here is that um, when you include a white last name, these are odds ratios. When you include a white last name, people are more likely to perceive that name as white. Uh, when you include a black last name, people are less likely to perceive it as white. Um, the odds ratio just falls through the floor when you have a Hispanic last name. And then class matters here too. So within the lowest quartile of mother's education in the birth record data, um, if, the, if that name appears in, in that quartile, then respondents are less likely to see that name as white. And if it's in the highest quartile compared to the middle two quartiles, respondents are slightly more likely to see that name as white. A similar pattern emerges for black first names, although the class results are reversed in that um, respondents are much more likely to see a name as black if, you, uh, if the name is in the lowest quartile of mother's education and much less likely to see a name as black um, if that mother, if that name is in the mother's uh, highest quartile of mother's education. So just a quick interim discussion here is that we, I find large variation in congruent perception. In other words, signaling that a name is white, people are perceiving that it's white. That's highly dependent on social class and last name information. Social class has opposite effects for white and black names. That's not surprising. And so overall, this suggests that internal validity for these kinds of studies might not be as high as we think since no one seems, or not many people seem to be picking studies on uh, names on any sort of scientific basis like this. So turning to the immigrant generational status uh, uh, study, uh, 
there's a lower number of respondents in this study and a lower number of names tested. This is um, a much smaller scale project to sort of test the um, proof of concept here. But essentially a similar idea in that people were given a, a set of names. There's more variation here and then I use white, black, Hispanic, Indian and Chinese names. Um, and except for white and black, there's variations in whether or not um, the names are, are white or um, anglicized first name with an ethnic last name or ethnic both first and last name. And then respondents are asked to identify the birth location, whether US or not, of the person that has this name and their parents. So to simplify this for people, I didn't want to have any confusion about saying, you know, identify if this person's a first, second, third generation, et cetera. I wanted to just quickly be able for them to understand that you're identifying if you think this person was born in the US and if their parents were as well. Um, so this one's a multiple choice setup and you can see this is what it looks like. So there's three options plus a, I'm not sure. And I'm just gonna show you some quick descriptive statistics here for time. So not surprisingly, the vast majority of people suggest that white uh, names and black names are uh, belong to people born in the US and their parents are born in the US, although there's a small difference between white and black. And even within white, there was a difference between male and female names. Um, for those that have fully ethnic first and last names, um, there's a split in that for Hispanic names, roughly 40% uh, of people um, suggest that this person was born in the US, but their parents weren't. And then about 40% of people suggest that this person wasn't and their parents weren't. Um, the percentage for this person wasn't and their parents weren't is higher for Indian and Chinese names. And then when you include a white or Anglo first name instead of an ethnic first name, you see that this shifts to the left, that more people are suggesting um, that perhaps this person was born in the US and their parents were. Um, and fewer people are suggesting that both were not born in the US. Okay, so finally the correspondence audit data. So what we've done here is collected existing data from correspondence audits published or in working paper format that were conducted in the US or Canada and examined responses for both whites and blacks or whites and Hispanics. We record the response rates for all groups. So if a white, um, uh, if whites received a 15% callback rate in an employment study and blacks received a 12% callback rate, um, that's essentially the kind of data that we're recording. We coded the aspects of the context, so what type of study it was, if it's in hiring or housing or something else, if they used uh, men, women, or both, uh, the date, the data collection, uh, the locations that they tested, um, whatever their uh, research was testing discrimination in, and then some important aspects of study design, including what kinds of last names and first names they used, um, other types of signals they might have in the study, like this person has a college degree, and if they're matching people um, in their study or if everything is sent um, just to one single um, employer or real estate agent. And then our, de our dependent variable here then becomes the what we call the response discrimination ratio. So it's the the ratio of white responses over non-white responses for, for each group. So if you have a ratio above one, that means uh, the in this study, whites were favored and a ratio below one means that non-whites were favored. And I'll show you some variance weighted least squares models predicting um, the ratio. So this is the descriptive statistics of all these studies that we've collected. There's 67 studies looking at white black discrimination across a whole host of um, contexts, although you can see that employment and rental housing are the two main contexts where people um, examine discrimination with these types of field experiments. A lower number of Hispanic studies, so I'm not gonna focus on that today, but just so you can see what that data looks like. Um, about half the studies look at both men and women. Um, and then we see, importantly for the today's talk, the differences in um, signaling last names. So. Uh, for studies looking at white black discrimination, a little over half of them are using uh, black first and last names all the time. Uh, uh, less than 10% are using all black first names and all white last names all the time. Uh, a little over a quarter of the studies then use some combination of those two things. So they might use um, uh, Jamal Decker and Jamal Washington in their study. 
And so these variance, uh, variance weighted least squares regressions can tell us a number of things about the studies. But what I want to focus on here are these looking at how black last names influence the um, discrimination ratio. And so when studies use all names like Jamal Decker rather than Jamal Washington, the discrimination ratio is lower in that study. And there's a, there's a um, middle ground where using both white and black last names uh, to signal black names results in a slightly smaller discrimination ratio compared to studies that only use black first and black last names. The next step for this project is looking at this as at an individual level rather than a study level. And what I mean by that is each of these studies, like I showed you with Bertrand and Mullenathan, have a series of names that they use. And so what we could do is take the perception rate for a particular name and see within a study how that impacts the response that they receive. And so just a sort of preview of this is that you can see across a, a, a large number of these studies in three contexts, how these names stack up. So even just within the blue employment studies, some studies up here, um, some names within studies receive about a 30% callback rate when they use a particular white male name. And other than this zero outlier down here um, that had just a low uh, denominator, some studies are, are getting response rates under 10%. This as a whole is shifted a little higher for, for um, white female names, a little lower for black male names, and a little lower for black female names. So there's lots of variation happening both within and across studies. And our goal is to um, take a look at how this impacts the discrimination that we see. Sorry, I went backwards. Okay, so just some quick conclusions here. There's, from the first study, there's significant variation in how individuals perceive race and ethnicity from black names, less variation for white names, and minimal variation for Hispanic names, particularly when you're signaling uh, both Hispanic first and last names. Both social class um, uh, demographic data behind those names and the inclusion of last names is important in, in determining how people perceive these names. And what I believe is happening that's supported by some early regressions on the individual name level is that field experiments of racial discrimination are actually capturing class discrimination as well. From the immigrant generational status um, project, we see that you can signal immigrant generational status through names. People do read this as a signal. Um, and it, you could read this one of two ways that now we could study immigrant discrimination, but it also could present challenges in examining racial ethnic discrimination against Hispanics and Asian Americans in particular. And finally, a major takeaway from all of this work is that it's important to pretest names, whether you're doing field or survey experiments, if you're using names to signal race and ethnicity, you need to pretest the names and not just make assumptions or use other people's um, pre previously used names and that the selection and perceptions of these names is, is, is likely predicting response rates and correspondence audits. So um, I, that's all I have for now. Sorry, I went a little over time, but um, I look forward to your questions and thank you very much. Next up, we have uh, Dr. Renee Flores, who is the uh, Neubauer Family Assistant Professor of Sociology here uh, at Chicago. Um, his research is uh, his research interests are in the fields of um, migration, race and ethnicity, and social stratification. Um, some of Renee's work, I think, speaks to questions that came up earlier in the first panel, kind of around group formation, boundaries, perceptions. Um, in particular, he studied some of the social psychological processes that govern our perceptions of group membership or classification uh, in a study titled, uh, Who are the Illegals? Um, so in any case, uh, uh, thanks, Renee, uh, for participating in the conference. Um, you can take it away. Uh, thanks uh, so much, uh, Jeff and Steve, for your kind invitation to this panel. I'm also very honored to be here. In my, in my regular work, I, um, I interact more with the literatures in, in political science and psychology. So for me, like listening to the conversation at the beginning was really informative and instructive. Um, the, the way uh, economics looks at these different topics. And I think this kind of conversation across disciplines could be actually quite productive. So the, today I'm going to talk about some of the, the approach I take in my own work. 
Uh, I was just at PAA last week, and, and, I, and I, I basically uh, uh, told people in my panel that we should probably switch professions and become archaeologists. You know, we should become archaeologists of meaning. And I, and I said that they have great paid, great benefits there, uh, although I don't really know exactly. But uh, this is the approach I take in my own research. I essentially subscribe to the analytical sociology tradition of identifying uh, the questions that I think are theoretically important and that may have uh, public policy impact, especially in regards to inequality. I'm very interested in trying to establish the nature of the relationship of the variables that, that I'm looking at, essentially if it's a causal or non-causal relationship, and identifying the mechanisms that mediate this, this relationship. Uh, I guess my work uh, uh, using the terminology of, of um, you know, that we used at the beginning, um, it, it, it would be, you, you could classify it as trying to understand the social construction of beliefs, so social construction of uh, attitudes. Uh, I, what the, the, the semantic part, I take it from the idea that in social research, I believe that many times we use certain concepts in our own modeling, in our own empirical work, that we do not necessarily directly engage and try to understand what they mean. I call these black boxes, right? These remain unseen, a little bit buried, and I feel like unpacking them, understanding their meaning, how their meaning is socially constructed, could actually uh, move ahead the research Quite a bit. Today I'm going to talk about three different examples that I've used in my own work in which I've tried to unpack meaning of different social categories and social labels. Typically this involves using in, an inductive approach and I use uh, ethnographic research, I use uh, personal interviews, uh, open-ended items and surveys, uh, latent class modeling and uh, another uh, statistical tools in order to try to inductively understand what people um, mean when they use specific concepts. The first case I'm going to talk about today is um, stereotypes around interracial dating. If you look at public uh, opinion data, this is data collected from Gallup since the 1950s, what we've seen is that uh, increasingly more and more people agree with marriages between whites and blacks. You know, it got to the point that in 2014, uh, Gallup essentially dropped the question because they were not getting enough variance in terms of their responses. Of course, we have the work of uh, Larry Bobo, Bonilla Silva in sociology that would argue that a lot of this uh, alleged change could be driven by social desirability bias, right? That, 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 that that's driving what's acceptable to say in a public setting, like providing an opinion in a survey. Anecdotally, we know that, that there's still some skepticism, there's still some reluctance, there's still some uneasiness about interracial coupling. And what I wanted to understand was that we know that there's a lot of negative stereotypes about racialized minorities. We know that. But can there also be a spillover effect and an and effect also people who date these minorities, people who date outside of their race, can there be also spillover stereotyping effect there? When you look at the literature, it was mostly qualitative in nature. And um, so what I did was to take a step back and said, okay, systematically, I want to understand what are the stereotypes that people associate with people who date outside of their race. In order to do that, I conducted focus groups with the help of two fabulous undergraduate um, students at the University of Michigan. And we talked with, with different folks, with college students, also with work with older folks that were working class to get more variation in our responses. And what we found essentially is that just like the Bonilla Silva literature would argue that there's a lot of social desirability bias, right? People are very reluctant to say, oh yeah, I have these issues with people who date outside of their race. Um, so we had to change our questioning a little bit more we had to use indirect questioning, asking them about, what about people that you might know? What about your parents or, or grandparents in the case of college students? Do you think that they have some ideas about folks who date outside of their race? And with that type of questioning, we were actually able to get more meaningful information. And uh, we identified four main stereotypes inductively. There was a, a, a class a component of that. There was a cultural component. There was a sexual uh, stereotype as well and went about trying to climb the social structure, right? So then I, I said, okay, can we actually systematically assess them 
on the population level? Can we actually find the same stereotypes across the, the US population? And can we actually establish causality here? As you might imagine, people who people select into the, into the specific kinds of, uh, of romantic arrangements, and there could be some confounding biases driving this, this relationship. So I wanted to understand if indeed uh, interracial dating leads to all these different stereotypes. So what I did is I essentially created a, a vignette study and this uh, where I um, hired actors and actresses, and this was really quite elaborate, to simulate different dating scenes. That, that there would be a coffee date, walking embrace, and a wedding proposal, which you can see here. This is me in my younger postdoc uh, days. And every time we would try to do this um, uh, wedding uh, proposal, people would start clapping and, and really <laughs> congratulate the, the, the couple. Something about the, the, the warm nature about the Midwest, I guess. Um, so here, as you can tell, the, what we're doing here is we, we're telling a story of Mary, who is either a black or a white woman, and we are um, randomly vary the race of her partners um, and holding everything else constant, right? This was pretty difficult to, to do because, you know, we had to find actors that were about the same build, were, you know, that the same class background. And um, as you can tell, the pictures were taken from behind as to minimize showing their faces because a face provides a lot of information, right? Aggression, friendliness, attractiveness. We wanted to keep that a little bit more uh, contained. Uh, the, uh, I also have to say that we, we shot this in, in Michigan in, um, actually that's where Michael Gaddis and myself, we met as postdocs. This was in spring, it was very cold. So the actors could only, could only post for a few seconds before you know, we had to give them this big, buffy, warm jackets for them. Um, so once we, we took all these different pictures, I conducted a, a national representative survey experiment with uh, both men and black and, and white men. And I found that uh, definitely we found evidence for a lot of the stereotypes that we found, but that age was a key mechanism that mediated this relationship. We found that most of these stereotypes were really driven by the older population, right? Um, the, the only stereotype that we, found, that we found among younger folks was a cultural one, right? That if you date outside of your race, you share the culture of the group you date. You share this black culture, you share this white culture. And I think that goes to show you how race and culture, they're so intertwined in the American psyche, right? I mean, that, that, it's really hard to... The, the, the black box here was about the stereotypes of interracial dating. We explore their meanings using uh, an inductive approach. And then we use a deductive methodology experiments to actually try to understand the, the, the nature of the relationship here. The second case I would like to study, actually I would like to show today, is showing you that the, the black box here is this picture here. He's trying to understand when people look at this picture that essentially signals illegality, signals undocumented immigrants, what is the mental image that people have? What are the, the, the attributes, individual attributes that triggered for someone to classify others as quote unquote illegal or undocumented, right? We wanted to understand perceptions of illegality. And this is our argument. And by the way, this, this research is in collaboration with my friend and colleague, Ariela Schachter who's a sociologist at Washington University in St. Louis. Our argument is this, immigration laws are actually very complex and uh, even for immigration authorities. So when immigration authorities, when ICE agents decide whom to stop, whom to question, whom to suspect, they typically do not rely on documentation status to judge that, to make that judgment. Instead, we argue that they rely on widespread social stereotypes about who is illegal and who's not regardless of actual documentation status. We refer to this as social illegality. This is a concept that we coined, essentially thinking, thinking that some bodies will be classified or be suspected of being undocumented, regardless of their actual documentation status. We think that this could be a new form of inequality in the sense that teachers, landlords, police officers may react to some folks that may be suspect in terms of their illegal status in a different way. If you are a teacher in a classroom, you have only a finite set of resources. You might try some, you might treat some kids differently based on whether or not you think that they might take advantage of the resources that you can provide to them. You know, if you think they're undocumented, 
you might not treat them uh, similarly. And there's actually some anecdotic data of this, how even ICE agents who are supposed to be experts in this, they use cultural cues, they rely, they rely on stereotypes to flag people as suspect, to flag people as potentially undocumented, in this case, Spanish uh, last names. When you look at the actual data, undocumented immigrants are actually a very diverse uh, population group. They vary a lot by national origin, by race, by ethnicity, by class. There's many of them, hundreds of thousands, that are blue. There are white collar workers, actually. But um, you know, one of the factors that I share with my undergrads is I ask them, how many illegal Canadians and illegal Europeans live in the U.S. And in all my years of teaching, they never get it right. There's about half a million of them. But when you think about undocumented folks these folks will not come to mind, right? Because there's specific stereotypes about who are the undocumented folks. Qualitative researchers like my colleague, uh, Angela Garcia at, the, at the, the University of Chicago, they basically uncover this rich evidence about specific stereotypes such as Mexican gardeners, right? That people suspect these folks of being undocumented. The issue with this is that Mexican gardener itself is a, it's a black box, right? It's, very, it's a very complex multidimensional concept where you have ethnicity, race, class, occupation, age, gender, and it's not clear which one of these traits is actually uh, creating these perceptions of being undocumented. So the questions for us here was where can we disentangle these multiple factors and try to understand which ones are the most important in triggering these perceptions of illegality? And also, can we also assess how systematic these stereotypes are? You might think that, well, this might be a stereotype only close to the border or maybe in certain places, but it might not be um, systematically shared by other folks. In order to test that, Ariel and I, we relied on a very powerful experimental tool called Paired Conjoint Survey uh, Experiment. And this was actually uh, developed in marketing and, 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 and introduced to the social sciences by uh, political scientists, Hein Miller and Hopkins. And essentially what this experimental setup does is that you have two different uh, profiles. In this case, we have two different immigrants and we ask people to judge, do you think immigrant one is undocumented? What about immigrant two? And you have a number of different variables that you randomly, uh, and, and their value you actually randomly uh, vary. In this case, we looked at the literature and also our own research to try to identify what would be the most relevant traits that would actually trigger these perceptions of illegality, right? So you may think about education, national origin, occupation, gender, and you, you basically randomly vary the values in each row and essentially you conduct an, an independent experiment for each row. And that way you're able to recover, you're able to recover the independent effects of each trait net of all the other variables that you are randomly varying. We um, did a lot of pre-testing of this instrument. You know, we relied on MTOR, although we do that a little bit less because of concerns with the platform. We use Lucy, they're prolific now more often. We pre-registered our design and our analysis plan. And this is something that is very important to us. There's a whole literature. Um, think about the work of, of uh, uh, Andy Gelman about researchers, degrees of freedom. And we think that this is very important, especially when you conduct your own data, right? And then we uh, apply our experiment to a national representative sample of Anglo adults, non-Hispanic whites. And what we found was that, as you might expect, national origin, language skills, class, these are very important triggers of perceived illegality. Essentially, what people have in mind is a, a blue collar, low educated um, person that just crossed the border, right? That's the typical uh, stereotype, which by the way, is not granted on reality. Most undocumented immigrants, they've been living in the US for 20 years or so, right? And they're already pretty well embedded within our communities. Nonetheless, this is not what we found. Um, and I think we, we, we imagine a big part of that is like the rhetoric that you can find on the media. Nonetheless, the most surprising finding for us was that the biggest effect that we found was for one variable that we almost didn't include. 
We included right at the end, and that was criminal record. The, uh, the reason for that is, is because when you look at reality, when you look at data, there's a negative association between illegality and criminal behavior. Undocumented immigrants commit very few crimes for many reasons that, that we can think of. Nonetheless, we also know that in the media, in, in politics, there is political entrepreneurs that constantly make the case about criminal caravans, rapists, murderers, uh, gangs. So maybe in the minds of folks, there's an, incre an increasing association between illegality and criminality. And that's exactly what we found. We found that the biggest predictor of being perceived as, Ill as illegal, as undocumented, is the commission of crimes. If I tell you that a certain immigrant committed murder, kill someone, the probabilities of being classified as undocumented go by 30 points, which is a huge effect in these kinds of experimental setups, a huge effect. It's the first time that I find such sizable effect. Burglary, sexual assault, criminal gang affiliation. These are not based on reality. Nonetheless, we find that, that in people's minds, there's an increased connection of, this, of these traits. And you can think about these attitudes could potentially shape other attitudes such as preferences for public policy and the like. This is a table where I go back to, to here, essentially the black box where it's trying to understand perceived illegality. Uh, and here we didn't use an inductive approach, but in the next project, I did use an induct inductive approach. So in case number two, I try to understand what people think of when they think about undocumented folks. Here, I take a step even farther back and say, what do people think of when they think about immigrants? And this work is in collaboration with, uh, with um, Ariel Azar, who is a sociology grad student at the University of Chicago. What we're trying to understand is, is um, how do perceptions of immigrants, of who immigrants are, first of all, let's track them down. Let's understand who people understand when they think of immigrants. And also the second question is, how do they shape uh, individual preferences for different public uh, policies. When you look at the survey item that we've been using for decades in order to understand or to assess immigration attitudes, th this, is, this is the one, and, and I'm, not a, I'm not a big fan of it, right? There's a lot of complexity here. We've been using these questions since the 1960s, and it basically reads, thinking now about immigrants, that is, people who come from other countries to live here in the US, in your view, should immigration be kept at its present level, increased or decreased? The nice thing is that we've been asking this question for a long time. So as you can tell, there's been ebbs and flows in, in these preferences since the 1960s to, the, to 2019. Um, but the use of immigrants as a black box itself, I think it's problematic in the sense that who knows what people think of when you talk about immigrants? because of the, of the diversity that exists in terms of ethnicity, class, race, these understandings may have varied over time and also may have varied even within the same time era, different people may actually think of different folks, which could have substantial attitudinal consequences. This is a slide when I connected back to theory, but in the interest of time, I just wanna say that increasingly there's a small but growing literature that is recognizing that what matters here it's not the objective reality of immigration, but perceptions of immigrants, right? So people, sociologists and, and, and political scientists have asked people about um, how big do you think the immigrant population is? How educated do you think they are, right? And they found that. They find that most people have a very distorted view of immigration, but that these perceptions actually are very predictive of their public policy attitudes. We wanted to do something a little bit different and say, you know what, let's not even impose the categories that we're gonna ask people about. Let's just actually see what, they, the, 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 what are the salient categories that regular people use when they think about immigrants, right? And to do that, we did this um, open-ended survey of over 400 folks, and we just asked them, when you think about immigrants, who comes to your mind? Can you describe them? Can you list their traits? absolutely uh, open-ended and inductive. 
much to our surprise as sociologists, we found that the number one trait that people mentioned were psychological traits. So score one for psychology here. Uh, most people said uh, lazy or hardworking, resilient, and um, the, the, the other, other traits were uh, national origin, class, language. Something that was pretty interesting here is that some of the traits that have been used in this literature to, to measure um, perceptions, like using social services or religion, most people actually don't, don't think about it when they think about Im immigrants, right? Another interesting uh, part of this is like when we examine the open-ended answers, we found evidence that these traits sort of hung together. They clustered. They were not randomly um, invoked. For example, this person said, who are immigrants? Well, a short, dark-skinned Mexican man who mows the lawn for a living and doesn't speak any English. Another person said, an Indian that owns or works at a convenience store, brown-skinned, accent, red dot on forehead, sometimes a turban. Essentially, they're describing Apple from The Simpsons, right? So, so we, we find that, 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 that uh, there's evidence of this clustering, uh, and we call these immigrant archetypes, that people have specific multidimensional characters that come to their mind that they use to make sense of reality and to organize all this complexity, right? That there's these pictures in their mind that, that, that they use to understand uh, the very complex uh, reality of immigration. So here we wanted to understand, okay, can we find these pictures in their minds using the, the term from Walter Liebman? Can we, can we identify these immigrant archetypes in a national representative sample, you know, on a population, you know, uh, basis. So we conducted a, another survey here that was national representative, and based on the open-ended results that we got, we developed different survey items trying to measure those uh, traits that became salient for our respondents. Do you think most immigrants come from Mexico, or from Europe? Do you think they're low educated? They're white, young men. And we use a technique developed in sociology by Paul Lasserfield, who was a, a, a mathematical sociologist called latent class analysis, which is essentially a way to, to find unseen latent relationships, latent ways to organize, um, in this case would be columns in your data set, right? You think about, it's a data reduction technique, uh, similar to let's say cluster analysis. In cluster analysis, uh, you, 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 you bring people together based on the on rows here is based on columns, right? We find five different latent classes. Essentially, these are different immigrants, different characters, different immigrant archetypes that people uh, have in mind when they think about immigrants. I don't have time to describe all of them, right? But they're essentially made up of the different traits that we uh, identified. Just want to mention two of them, which are the extreme ones. About 17% of Americans think about a, a high status worker when you talk about immigrants. This is, this is um, a, a worker that comes from either Asia or Europe, highly educated. This person is documented. And these folks have the most positive attitudes towards immigration, the most positive ones. And by the way, these, these archetypes cut across partisanship levels, cut across class. So there's Democrats as well as Republicans who actually think about high status workers, right? The other, in the other end of the spectrum, we find that about 38% of Americans think about an undocumented Latino man. This is a person that comes from Mexico, Central America, or South America. This person is undocumented, low status, low education, men, very little English skills. First, the people who believe in this, that, that most immigrants subscribe or conform to this archetype express the most negative views on uh, immigration and immigration policy and the capacity of immigrants to, uh, to integrate. So essentially, when you th this is a way for us to go back to this question that we pose. And now we know that when we pose this question in our service, thinking now about immigrants, now we know that people have different understandings. They understand this, this question differently based on their own uh, mental processes. In this, how impactful are these archetypes to public opinion? Well, here we're running a regression predicting, uh, saying that you want decreased immigration flows. And we include a lot of different independent variables that are used on the literature. 
we find that, and we use the latent classes here as predictors. The reference category here is uh, the high status immigrant worker, the most favored. And we found the effect sizes are typically larger than most other independent variables that are used in this literature. Class, college attendance, gender, even some point partisanship. And like I said, these effects cut across um, class, partisans, partisanship level. And uh, essentially we conclude three different things. One is that there's little consensus among natives about who immigrants are. There's a lot of heterogeneity here that these perceived traits are actually clustered in natives' minds at the forming uh, multi-dimensional entities that we call immigrant archetypes, which has a number of consequences for research, right? When politicians or researchers invoke one immigrant trait, if I say um, undocumented, you might be invoking the whole archetype here, all the different traits that hang together. The other part too is that the existence of these archetypes that are not related to objective conditions, because we also tested that, may explain why immigration attitudes are pretty stable over time, in the sense that this that since they're based on these archetypes, uh, and these archetypes are cultural schemas, we know that cultural attitudes, cultural schemas are actually very hard to change. They're pretty stable over time. There's a lot of sociological literature on that. Um, and lastly, we find that it is not the reality of immigration that shapes how people feel about immigration, about immigration uh, public policies, but it's about their subjective perceptions. And this is exactly what we're trying to do, trying to objectively study the subjective nature of these beliefs. And these are some of the references from this work. I, I, you know, I also work a lot on racial classification and I'm trying to understand how people are sorted into different race labels, but I didn't explore that in this talk, but I'll be more than happy to talk about this in our um, in the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Renee. What, one quick clarification question, um, and maybe I'm misremembering, but you guys also randomly uh, manipulated documentation status in the Who Are Illegal study, is that right? No, no, we didn't. That, that was our uh, dependent variable, trying to understand the, um, who who would be classified as undocumented. Oh, okay, I must be misremembering things then. All right, thanks. Okay, so uh, next um, uh, we have Dr. Uh, Betsy Palak, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Psychology and in the School of uh, Public and International Affairs at Princeton. Um, her research is concerned with the reduction of prejudice and conflict, uh, including ethnic uh, and political conflict, uh, con uh, conflict among children in schools, um, and violence against women. Uh, she uses um, field experiments to test interventions that uh, target individuals' um, uh, perceived norms and behavior about conflict, um, including mass media and peer-to-peer uh, -peer interventions. Um, so Betsy, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're all very much looking forward to your insights on this topic. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. I'm gonna give a talk about um, prejudice reduction and um, the research on interventions to reduce prejudice. I'll tell you a little bit more. We've had a lot of discussions today so far about what, what exactly is entailed by prejudice. Um, and uh, this is a paper that just came out this year with um, in the Annual Review of Psychology with my colleagues, my former postdoc, Boni Porat, who's now at Hebrew U, my graduate student, Chelsea Clark, there in the middle, and my um, PhD, former PhD advisor uh, and ongoing collaborator, Don Green, at uh, now at Columbia. And it's a paper that asks this question, what works to reduce prejudice? Um, following up on uh, a really large review that uh, Don and I did back when I was still a graduate student. This is from 2009. And what we did in this paper was we really just tried to hoover up the entire literature, um, not exclusive to psychology, but in all um, of the social and biomedical and uh, policy literatures, uh, both published and unpublished. And there we just asked, what research is out there at all evaluating the effects of interventions, treatments, um, policies 
to reduce prejudice. Um, and this paper, the previous paper was um, methodologically all inclusive. So we looked at qualitative, um, quantitative, experimental, non-experimental studies. And one of our main conclusions was actually that the experimental studies were really missing. So for anyone who was looking for causal identification of what are the impacts of these interventions, um, aside from the phenomenology of participating in them, the um, qualitative reactions among, among those who have participated, we, we, we really didn't know. Um, and so that was one of the main um, uh, conclusions from this paper. And it was paired with a plea for more uh, causally identified work in the future that could actually um, convince a skeptic that um, you might want to use or, or choose, choose wisely among all of the various options. So our, our questions for the prejudice reduction literature this time around, now um, published in 2021, were, were three. First of all, just what's happened in the last dozen years since we published that, that report. Um, what are the average effects of these interventions? So this time we limited our inquiry to experimental studies where there was um, random assignment to um, some kind of prejudice reduction intervention or to a comparison uh, or, um, or no, no treatment um, control group such that we could tell what was the direction of effects. And then finally, um, and centrally, um, can social science answer the public's call to reduce prejudice in the world? And we started this um, obviously before this past summer. Um, this past summer, a lot more people grew interested in this, um, in this question. Um, and so the timing was interesting. And I'm gonna just tell you all of the answers to these questions right off the bat and then get into a defense of, of the conclusions that I'm telling you about here. Um, so first of all, over the past dozen years, we see a sharp uptick in prejudice reduction research. And some of these papers are absolutely going to become classics. You may end up teaching them not only in a class on prejudice, but classes on social science uh, methodology because some of the designs are ingenious and, and rigorous and um, quite creative. However, the modal research is very different from these future classics. And of course, technically that is just, or operationally speaking, that is true. Um, but Unfortunately, they're different in ways that are quite troubling. So um, in particular, there's many reasons not to trust the majority of the research um, in this uh, on prejudice reduction. Um, and then um, to drill down into this even uh, further, some of our most popular prejudice reduction ideas, um, popular for social scientists and biomedical scientists, um, but also popular uh, to lay people and in our public discourse are not well supported by the data. In some cases, there's um, evidence of an absence of effect. And in other cases, there's a, a sheer absence of any evidence. And then finally, um, and I think most depressingly, we find that the most rigorous research um, in this whole population shows quite small reductions in prejudice. Okay. So we use that to, to ask the next question, which is, you know, what should the next generation of prejudice reduction research look like if these are our conclusions? And then relatedly, and, and this is the least data-driven um, question I'm going to pose, and I'll save it for the end because it's more of an editorial. Um, I wanna know, are we using the right model of change? And I'll talk more about that at the end. So first, let me just defend these conclusions. Um, there's an uptick in prejudice reduction research. And what you'll see is that there's an uptick in most types of prejudice reduction research, methodologically speaking, at least. So that black line shows just the absolute frequency, the number of studies produced per year from 2007 to 2019. Um, and you can see that's driven by lab research and also um, the increasing relevance of online research to many of the social and biomedical sciences, but absolutely um, inclusive of prejudice reduction as well. And unfortunately, what we really called for in our previous paper was um, to see more field experiments. And we see that that was a largely unheeded call. That's a, the orange line kind of toggling along, along at the bottom there, only about you know one to three field experiments per year. The way we identified the population of studies is um, through a, a pretty rigorous um, methodology. Um, this is a pr our PRISMA chart, too small for you to see, but um, put there to say that we followed biomedical uh, standards for our meta-analysis, so it's fully replicable and we have all of our search terms, um, data, 
and analysis code up on Dataverse if you want to look at any of this and do further analysis. We searched five separate databases. Four of those are replicable, replicable searches. One we included as a check on ourselves. Um, it was a proprietary algorithm that the Princeton Library Sciences owns, a text-based algorithm uh, search. And we found over 16,000 non-unique uh, results, which uh, resulted in a um, you know, bonanza of a summer reviewing all of them. And, and about 1,800 we read in full with the PIs and our, our master's level research team. As a criteria for what is included in the meta-analysis, it had to address prejudice broadly defined as animus. So this um, brings me back to Dr. Bobo's talk. Um, obviously, there are some studies that are interested in perceptions of status and, and of relative status. And we included that. We went the, the sort of bloomer uh, meets back up with uh, Gordon Allport approach of, of including that in our, in our broader definition of animus because we just simply just wanted to put our hands around as many studies as possible. Um, and many of these kinds of studies in any case use the term prejudice to, to mean uh, what they're talking about. Um, and it also had to be experimental. We excluded sexism and um, interventions to reduce sexism following our previous review um, for reasons we can get into if you're interested. Those two types of interventions stem from very different um, literatures. And so it just made sense to exclude that in the first round. We also didn't include any um, partisan prejudice, which is a growing area. So watch that space in the social sciences. So reducing what people are now sometimes terming as prejudice, for example, between American Democrats and Republicans, et cetera. Uh, we also excluded collegiate bias. So you won't see any studies trying to reduce the you know, Ohio State, Michigan biases here. Um, our final sample included 418 experiments um, in 309 manuscripts, and we coded all of them, both quantitatively getting their effect sizes um, and being very generous in doing so. So um, many of these studies have several, um, maybe even a dozen outcomes, and we just allowed the authors to tell us what was, what was most important, um, not by their pre-registration, because very few of these papers have pre-registrations, but rather what... Um, what outcomes they featured in their analysis. So I mentioned that to say, this is really the best look you can get at these papers, right? You could have followed another strategy of selecting um, the outcomes that, that you consider to be most important, um, even if they're not the ones that, that worked out statistically uh, for in, in favor of the authors showing that their, their intervention worked well. Okay, so I told you that several pre prejudice reduction studies are just destined to become classics. I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, they featured really robust, really realistic interventions that involved social as well as psychological processes. So um, by contrast, some of these interventions might be characterized more of uh, as proof of concept. So they're um, you know, very narrow you know, trainings that happen in a, in a social psychological laboratory, for example, and you, it really stretches the imagination to think about taking that intervention and implementing it in a, in a company. The ones that we really mark as landmark here are the studies where it would be easy to implement their implementation or implement their intervention. It's, it's well described, it's, it's fully realized and it's, it's ready to go. Um, and then they also use very robust methods to test the outcomes. So they use large sample sizes, measure behavior as well as attitude. They attend to randomization, um, particularly things like attrition and, and handle it appropriately. Um, and uh, they pre-register and use open data. Now, what's really interesting about this group of studies is that we actually find that among these landmark studies that have these characteristics, they're taking very um, different types of theoretical approaches to designing the interventions. Um, and yet all of them, what they have in common is that they show promising but limited, um, sometimes, um, you know, uneven um, and also small positive outcomes. So I'm just gonna give you a few illustrative, illustrative examples. I'm pairing together two studies that were um, published quite recently on team sports as an instance of intergroup contact. And in both cases, Lo in um, India and Sama Musa in uh, Northern Iraq, um, uh, purposefully brought teams together um, in either heterogeneous, in um, the case of India, high and low caste, and in um, Iraq, uh, Christian and Muslim players to play on the same teams or against one another, for example, to actually test the um, conditions of contact and not just whether people were coming into contact, which is really um, surprisingly for as long as that hypothesis has been around, 
um, uh, progress. So um, whether or not, for example, cooperation as a condition of this contact is, is very necessary. Um, they pre-registered these field experiments and, and really were quite innovative in their measurements. So um, some of, for example, um, the behavioral measures um, that were used involved giving um, Christian players uh, um, vouchers to see whether they would go and use those vouchers at Muslim restaurants that were specific to Muslim restaurants. So does the contact effects generalize outside of the team? Um, also, one of the measurements taken were measures of policy attitudes to see whether um, pot potentially reduced prejudice would generalize toward policy um, outlooks. Another example of a landmark study that we identified uh, took advantage of um, sort of early uses of bots on Twitter. Now, I think we're too aware of them for this kind of design to be as successful potentially, but used just a really elegantly simple um, design in which um, Twitter bots either identified as white or black men uh, using their Twitter avatar and as either low or high status as identified by their number of followers um, intervened and, um, and addressed uh, white men on Twitter who had been identified as using the N-word as a, as a racial slur. And the idea was who's most effective at getting this, um, these white male users of Twitter using this racial slur to, to not do so again. And so um, the intervention was clear. It tested idea, you know, theories of confrontation and whether that is enough to reduce expressions of prejudice. And it measured it over the long term. So they were able to follow those Twitter users for a very long time. And then finally, um, this study really stands out because it is one of, as you'll see, the only uh, field experiments of a diversity training that exists in the entire literature over time. Um, it, met, it tests one of the most popular ways to initiate a diversity training, which is online over the course of um, one day. It's a brief diversity training um, that pulls on a lot of sort of behavioral science classic behavioral science techniques. Um, and one thing that we really liked about this is that they worked in collaboration with um, a, a global corporation. And when they didn't have all of the administrative data that they would have liked from this corporation, they actually created, co-created opportunities for these corporate workers to participate in activities like signing up for mentoring uh, minoritized um, colleagues at work and they simply kept track of who did that. And so that was something initiated by the um, investigators in order to measure some behavioral outcomes of, of this kind of training. So the modal type of research, as I told you, however, is very different. So let's just look at the three most popular intervention approaches uh, by contrast. The first one is a category of intervention that didn't even exist the last time I wrote this review, um, and that's extended and imaginary contact. So if you take what you know about intergroup contact, this extends the theoretical idea to say, perhaps we would confer the same kinds of salutatory benefits on an individual if they simply knew that a friend had contact with an outgroup member, a stigmatized or, or despised outgroup member. Um, and perhaps a person would have the benefits of uh, a reduction in prejudice from contact by simply imagining contact, by asking a person to imagine uh, a conversation with an outgroup member, for example. That, that made up over a th or pretty much a, a third of all interventions in our population of um, prejudice reduction interventions over the last dozen years. The next category is a bit of a, a, a voluminous one that we simply titled cognitive and emotional training. This is a whole class of strategies that involved um, attempting to modify cognitive patterns, whether it was um, uh, ways in which individuals um, uh, reacted to uh, implicitly or thought about outgroup members or to retrain their emotional reactions. So uh, redirecting um, feelings like uh, anger or uh, suspicion um, or trying to modify other kinds of emotional reactions in, in conflict. Um, and the, the, that was that entire class of, um, of interventions there. And then finally, social categorization, which is almost a subcategory of that, but it is such a large um, uh, category that we broke it out on its own. And this is a category in which individuals are asked to reconceptualize in-group and out-group boundaries. So, you know, trying to think about an out-group as part of your, your larger in-group of, of, say, Americans or something like this. Okay, so... Um, 
what you what you can see just through those um, descriptions, why I went into describing what those you know top three categories of interventions uh, look like, is that what we've really arrived at in the last dozen years is a focus on prejudice reduction through mentalizing, through trying to through through attempting to change individuals' mental lives. That has been the focus of interventions. Um, on top of that, we also had a coding category that um, we defined as light touch, which is obviously a piece of um, jargon that we've adopted from the policy literature. We defined it um, in a way uh, that our, our coders could agree on what was light touch by saying that an intervention, if it were um, all three things, um, brief, cheap, and easy to implement, it should be coded as light touch. And what you can see is that 76% of all interventions in our database were coded as light touch. And then finally, as I've already previewed, one way in which the modal type of research is very different from the landmark studies I described, the database is rife with methodological problems. Um, this includes small sample sizes, a lot of attrition that isn't handled well econometrically on the back end. Um, a lot of studies are cluster randomized, but then um, analyzed at the individual level uh, without introducing any kinds of um, clustering in the error term. And there's this general lack of transparency in terms of not posting data, not pre-registering, et cetera. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna breeze through this. This is just um, different figures of other ways um, in which we could characterize the entire population of studies. Um, you know, a lot of them are still focusing on explicit attitudes or beliefs as outcome measures. Uh, race and ethnicity um, is still the most popular type of prejudice to target, although ability and um, immigration, asylum, refugee status is, um, is a, are other big ones. Um, and then most interventions are still evaluated on college campuses or online on MTurk or, some, or elsewhere. Okay, so here's the average effect. It's a D of 0.357. Um, and for all of you who don't necessarily think in D, uh, let me loosely uh, translate it into a scale that psychologists like to use a feeling thermometer, where zero is I feel very cold toward this group, let's say toward black Americans. Um, 100 would mean I feel very warmly toward black Americans. So if you take someone who has, um, what we might think of as a, a relatively more minor level of prejudice, so just below neutral at 40, um, this average effect would move them to a 48, just to put this in context. And again, that's after one intervention, right? So that's not over time, that's just, you know, on average what these interventions are, are reporting as, as their effect size. Now, I, I wanna break that apart a little bit and the most hands off the scale way I'm going to do it is by breaking apart that average effect into quintiles according to the study's sample size. So we chose sample size um, as a way of uh, talking to you about study quality, methodological quality, without having to make any, um, any um, judgments. This is going to be just a really cut and dry way to do it. And so if you look all the way on the left-hand side, that's treatment sample size. So how many people are in the treatment group? Um, you can see that the lowest quintile is 25 or fewer, which is quite small. There you see the effect size is 0.6, almost double uh, what we find on average. And of course, if there's no publication bias, we should not see the effect size tracking sample size. Um, but in fact, that is exactly what we see, right? And so at the top quintile, uh, what you see is an effect size, average effect size of 0.18, uh, much, much smaller. And this is what it looks like if I just plot it out for you. Um, so you can see an almost linear trend in which um, the, uh, average meta-analytic effect size is quite small uh, once you just make the cutoff for studies that um, might have more adequate power. Um, so what does that look like? The top quintile sample size, that effect size translates into moving from a 40 to a 44. And again, I, I, I think that it's really hard to say whether this is um, a failure because as you already know, these are very, on average, light touch interventions. They're short, brief, easy, they're, they're brief, easy to implement and cheap, and you get this positive movement. And so you could think of this as actually um, something to celebrate, and it's certainly in a positive direction. What I wanna show you here is that um, the average effect moves down when you isolate the more rigorous studies according to the sample size for every single kind of approach. So here are all of the different intervention approaches. And here they are when you just uh, reserve the uh, meta-analysis to the, the top quintile of, of sample size. And by the way, this is true for studies um, that are lab-based, 
uh, field-based and also um, online-based. So it's not a, an artifact of where they're being conducted. Okay, so another conclusion I, I gave to you is that some of the most popular prejudice reduction ideas are not well supported and diversity training is uh, probably one of the top examples. Diversity training is the tool that we turn to in our society, at least in the United States, um, when any kind of, of racist, sexist, um, religiously biased uh, event occurs that, that trainings are called for. And I'm just gonna back up one slide to show you that if you look all the way down at the very bottom of this figure, you see that the N for diversity trainings of number of uh, intervention studies is only two there. So there are exactly two studies of diversity training experiments um, evaluating a diversity training with a sample size of 78 or greater over the past dozen, dozen years. Right? So I think it's safe to say that um, there's an absence of evidence for this idea uh, with respect to whether or not we can reduce prejudice with, with a training. Implicit bias is another example. Um, there is a small but growing literature um, trying to evaluate implicit bias trainings per se, um, although implicit bias trainings were coded as diversity trainings, so the, the same um, dilemma there it applies. Um, but it also applies simply to the, the use of implicit bias as a measurement, right? So what we did was we were so interested in this question of implicit bias and whether any kind of intervention could reduce implicit bias, that we um, took the, uh, an effect size, a separate effect size for implicit bias if it was measured across any study. So we were always sure to capture the effect of any intervention on implicit bias. We were especially excited to correlate changes in implicit bias with changes in behavior to see if, if that was meaningful to, to show a change in implicit bias. And unfortunately, um, again, we arrive at this magic number of two. There were exactly two studies in our entire database that measured both implicit bias and behavior uh, across any kind of intervention. So I simply cannot tell you whether changing implicit bias using uh, an, an, an intervention um, means is it means anything when it comes to um, shifting someone's um, what you might want to call expressed preferences or, or behavior. Um, finally, there is an absence of evidence um, for an idea that is quite popular within social and political psychology. Although maybe I should really call out social psychologists um, for for promoting this idea, which is to say, it goes like this. Um, Sure, these are small changes that we're showing with our experiments, but they build over time. There are recursive processes that reinforce the changes that we observe. Um, it's uh, maybe a little bit like a snowball argument. And what we'd see is, again, uh, we collected any data all the time when uh, studies were trying to evaluate whether an effect uh, had any longitudinal duration, um, but we simply cannot say that we have enough data to test these claims. And so um, in this case, I, I think that it's best just to reserve arguments about whether small changes build over time. That is just simply an idea waiting to be tested that we cannot justify um, uh, small effects um, based on this idea that they will build or even maintain. Okay, so the best research shows very small effects. This figure is showing you what I've already shown you. So this is sort of a once more with feeling kind of demonstration. The reason I wanted to put the line through all of the data here is just to show you, this is again, measuring the effects um, uh, against the standard error, is that if you fit a regression line to this data, what it's suggesting here is that given the extant, uh, effect sizes, if we were to simply take the message that there are a lot of methodological problems in this literature and say, well, we're just going to do better and better studies, um, assuming that these effect sizes are in general true, um, better and better studies, that is uh, lower and lower error, um, as you can see, the, the line crosses zero at some point. It suggests that we would be finding potentially no change at all, the better identified studies that we get. So the question really here is, what are we doing? Is, is the are the avenues that we're currently pursuing with all of these interventions the right avenues? And what should the next generation of prejudice reduction research look like? Um, so we have a lot of recommendations in our paper that I think follow from where we are and suggest many improvements and ways to fill out the research literature. Where there are gaps, how can we fill them best? And, and how can we do so in the most rigorous and, um, and careful way possible and creative as well? Um, and we, we put out those recommendations for people who are both interested in field or laboratory work. 
Um, but I really want to just end here um, on a slightly less developed or at least data-driven um, idea, which is that um, we'd also like to invite the field to just think about different models of change. Um, and, and in particular, think more about intervening in structures. And um, you know, as you saw, what we've really been doing is trying to change the mental life of individuals. Um, what if we had a different model of change? And what would a prejudice reduction literature look like if we started from that model? Um, so as I said, the current model is really thinking of prejudice, even though I think that all of, or almost all of the, the research scientists doing this work would recognize that prejudice is a, has a structural basis, a, a social basis, um, it's still conceptualized implicitly most often in these studies as a psychological problem, uh, which requires individualized psychological interventions, right? Um, and, and the hope is that it creates both individual psychological change, but hopefully also societal change. So the alternative model would of course be, you know, how can we attack psychological problems with structural interventions? Um, and by structure, I don't mean just institution rules and leaders, which is the easiest way to think about it across the, the social sciences. I'm really trying to think about structure as levers for um, manipulating our collective uh, experience and, and awareness. And so to that end, you know, thinking about social structures like uh, mass collective experiences, unofficial organizations, you know, so there's there's no uh, board of trustees for black Twitter, but no one could deny that um, this is an unofficial organization that really changes the way a lot of people think about social norms and and um, and reconceptualize uh, I, some of our, our dearest held ideas, um, mass media events, etc. Right. And so I think that this is hard in part to do because behavioral theory um, and theory related to prejudice really only sometimes addresses structure. Oftentimes it really just addresses the individual. And so um, I've been trying to think, we've been trying to think uh, as, as in within our co-author group about ways to um, encourage people to have structural expressions, um, that is interventions from even the most individualistic uh, theories. Um, so first of all, you know, an example of a theory that that is structurally related, um, for example, social norms theory, which predicts that leaders can signal new social norms about the unacceptability of prejudice, that, um, that these signals are really powerful indicators of what's acceptable. And um, so we've been trying to do research on this, for example, looking at the way Supreme Court decisions that are relevant to um, the rights and freedoms of stigmatized groups change um, the way people to the extent to which Americans think that prejudice against those groups is acceptable. Um, a less structural intervention that you could derive from social norms theory, um, and it's very similar to what a lot of the kinds of interventions we saw in this database would be, for example, to send emails to people reminding them that their, that their leader, perhaps in their organization or in their town, um, has a progressive orientation as a way to try to, to, um, to amend their, their uh, perspective of, of the norm. Uh, just as an example of this individualized approach. And then with respect to individually oriented theory, one of the theories of prejudice reduction that has a lot of uh, attention right now is perspective taking or perspective giving um, uh, theory, which predicts that you know, if, you, if you try to experience the narrative of, of an outgroup member, either because they're giving it to you or you're trying to imagine it through their eyes, that this can reduce prejudice. Um, I want to suggest to you that some of the interventions that have made this idea or actually have sort of reinvigorated this idea um, might be thought of as structural. So um, many of you may know the, the David Brockman and Josh Kalla uh, canvassing interventions in which um, they've done several of these studies now where it's a part of the official canvassing strategy to ask people who um, answer their door to give examples of times in their lives where they, where they felt discriminated against or excluded uh, as a way to also um, give them the perspective of transgender people, illegalized immigrants, women um, seeking abortions. Um, and that is their canvassing strategy to try to change their votes on, on referendum um, for, for uh, the rights of these groups. Um, what I wanna suggest about this is that 
Sure, it's a dyadic intervention where two people are having a conversation. You could think of it as individualized. But what's interesting about that experience is, of course, the person answering the door knows that the canvassers are also going to everyone else in their neighborhood, which is a really relevant social reference group for them. Um, it's also a signal that a, a political campaign has this type of um, agenda. And so I think in that way, it sort of meets the uh, definition of one of these um, social structures where we're, we're changing someone's experience of the collective and um, they are finding very promising results in this regard. Um, I, I actually think that um, economists have been really, especially um, uh, uh, you know, historians um, working in a more economic space and um, economic historians have been really interested in how uh, structures change individual psychologies in a very interesting way for some time. So for example, looking at the way quotas for women or ethnic minorities change people's attitudes toward them. And this is, um, this is an approach that I think more social scientists should, should learn from. Um, so I think that, you know, in terms of this line of argumentation, that the next generation of prejudice reduction research, the, res the recommendations would be more about improving skills at thinking about the structural expressions of our theories, collaborating with one another more, um, uh, instigating lines of research to really understand how more top-down interventions and structural interventions might move forward, for example, how one could prevent backlash and, and resistance to some of those kinds of um, messaging campaigns or rule changing um, events. Um, it, it implicates, I think, social scientists in an interesting way in the push for equity reform because much equity reform can be thought of as a structural intervention. Uh, and, and we really know not that much about how it changes individual psychology. So I think the classic example here is that so many social scientists would love to get in to see whether a white fragility training, um, you know, uh, at, a, at a corporation, an important corporation, would increase the um, black and brown representation on the board of that corporation up to three years later or something like that. The suggestion here is that it should be exactly the opposite. So um, help to push for more representation on the board um, and in part justify it, not just on normative grounds, but as a way to investigate whether that kind of increased representation at the corporate board level would change um, levels of white fragility in the, in the corporation, right? So it's a flip. And then of course, finally, um, not all of these types of interventions will be available for experimentation as we identified it in this piece. And so, um, you know, we're going to need in part through these collaborations, if, if people in, in their own field is, are not expert in them, to use a variety of different causal identification strategies and be familiar with them. Um, okay, and that's it. Okay, thank you so much, Betsy. Um, Last, but uh, certainly not least, uh, we have Dr. Peter Blair, um, who's an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Education at Harvard University, um, where he co-directs the uh, project on workforce. Uh, he's also a, a research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, his research focuses on the link between uh, the future of work and the future of education, um, labor market discrimination, and uh, residential segregation. Um, uh, thanks for uh, participating in the conference, Peter. You can take it from here. Thank you so much. It's an absolute delight um, to be here. Uh, it's just wonderful to present this work, which is joint work with my colleagues, Papia de Broy and Justin Heck at Opportunity at Work. It's also a double honor to be here at Chicago, which is in a lot of ways, a kind of an intellectual home for me. I attended my very first external seminar as a PhD student um, at Chicago. This was the inequality summer school that, that Steve and Jim hosted in 2012. And I feel two really strong emotions when I come to present in Chicago. First, there's a deep sense of intellectual freedom and curiosity, where even the ideas of a fledgling graduate student could be taken seriously and deeply engaged by senior faculty or Nobel laureates. And then there's also the, the premium, the second emotion is the premium that places like Chicago put on the central role of measurement in terms of trying to understand inequality, which is going to be the focus of today's panel. I wanna focus my talk today on some, a stigma that's at the heart of degree bias, which shows up in the disparate trajectories of the wages of workers with college degrees and workers without college degrees. And unlike a lot of other forms of bias or prejudice, this is a form that's still fairly acceptable in our society, and in fact is very deeply encoded in our notions of merit. 
I just want to start off by just highlighting some of the members of my research group and talking a little bit about some of the other work that we have on discrimination. So we have work looking at inequality and in research funding for universities, um, work looking at the impact of occupational licensing in terms of reducing racial and gender wage gaps, and also impacts of also work looking at neighbor tipping to think about whether it's driven by racial preferences or the outside options of households. And I do this just to highlight the fact that a lot of research is collaborative. So for the graduate students who are in the audience, um, just wanna let you know, working with you is an absolute joy. It's common in the economics literature to refer to workers who have college degrees as being skilled and workers without bachelor's degrees as being unskilled. And in this paper, we're rather gonna make the argument that instead of being unskilled, these workers who have high school diplomas but not college degrees are instead stars. And by that, what we mean is that they're skilled through alternative routes, notably their work experience. We're gonna to contribute to the literature by showing that the skill content of a worker's current occupation is a good measure of a worker's skill. And this is a, a kind of measure that delinks the that decouples the link between skill and degree attainment. Secondly, what we're going to do is we're going to write down a model of the matching process of workers to occupations to define a notion of a skill mobility friction, which is going to allow us to quantify inequality in the labor market in terms of the, the mobility frictions experienced by stars and workers with bachelor's degrees. What we're going to show is that while all workers can transition to jobs that require skills that are similar to their previous jobs, stars are going to experience a lot more friction than workers with bachelor's degrees when transitioning to higher wage work despite both types of workers having fewer skills than are required in their destination occupations. And it's gonna be this existence of an opportunity gap that we're gonna propose as a complementary explanation for why there's been increasing labor market inequality that exists both at the beginning of a worker's career trajectory and that also um, is exacerbated across a worker's lifetime. So that's the, the plan for today's talk. I wanna start off first by situating our research within the context of the story of a star who we've gotten to know really well through our work. And this is the story of Joan, who's an office administrator. And Joan writes, I worked at a community college for two decades. I was among the first to be laid off when COVID hit. Even though I had more experience and skills than many of my colleagues, my previous supervisor once told me that had I gone to college, I would be running this community college. And Joan is not alone. Over 60% of the adult workforce in the United States are stars. And this is despite the fact that 74% of new jobs that have been created in the past decade have been created in jobs that typically hire workers with college degrees. And so we have this tremendous supply demand imbalance in terms of degrees. And what we wanna argue in this paper is that if we can look at workers differently in terms of their skills, then perhaps we can bridge this gap. Stars and workers with college degrees experience very different labor market trajectories. In this figure, we plot the wages of stars relative to the wages of, of workers with bachelor's degrees at different points along their career trajectory. And for two sets of two cohorts of workers starting in 1978, 1976 rather, and 1989. And some of the key features of the data that I wanna highlight is that looking at the 1976 cohort, we see that stars start their, their stars start their careers earning lower wages than their colleagues with bachelor's degrees. And this is to be expected given the, the college degree premium. But this gap widens over the lifetime trajectory of a star. And when we look at successive cohorts, this initial gap is larger. And then also the final gap is larger as well too. And so we have widening inequality across within, within a cohort and also across cohorts too. In fact, if we look at workers, stars who were in the 1989 cohort, you would notice that even after 30 years of job experience, they still have not caught up to the wages of a worker with a bachelor's degree um, at the age of 25 years old. And so there's something that's fundamentally different about the labor market that STARS experienced relative to workers with bachelor's degrees. And we're gonna unpack why is that the case. Canonical explanations for explaining in a labor market inequality by educational status include the human capital model, and signaling theory, as well as the model of skilled bias technological change, in which the presumption is that workers with bachelor's degrees are skilled, those without bachelor's degrees are unskilled, or at least don't have the skills that are complementary to recent technology, technological progress. Some of the core maintained assumptions of, of these approaches is number one, 
that the most important years of learning are the four years of, of learning that happened during college. Number two, that it's not really about the years of learning that happens in the, the 12 years before college or the 30 years of learning that happens over a worker's lifetime. When we look at the literature, both in economics as well as in education and psychology, there's ample evidence to believe that while human capital accumulation that is acquired during college is very important, that the human capital that workers acquire both before they go to college for stars and also during the workforce can be important. So for example, um, my colleague David Deming has work looking at the importance of early childhood education for lifetime outcomes for, for, for students. Daron Asimoglu and co-authors have worked looking at the importance of on-the-job training. David and, and his graduate student Kadim also have worked showing that for workers with bachelor's degrees in, in STEM fields, they initially experience a premium of about 40% of their wages once they graduate, but that skills premium depreciates over 10 years. Moreover, when we look at theories of learning from situation from when we look at theories of, of learning, for example, multiple intelligences, situated learning theory and constructivism, they're gonna hold that knowledge is multimodal, that learning happens while doing, especially in workplaces and among peers, and that the disequilibrium that's caused by the gap between a worker's current knowledge and a knowledge that they could futurally learn could spark additional growth. And so all of this literature is going to suggest that there is some scope for on-the-job learning to be a complementary pathway to the learning that happens in, in colleges, and that this could be another pathway. So how are we going to measure the workers? How are we going to measure the skills of workers who are stars? Because this is fundamental to, to the endeavor. We're going to use the OSTARnet database to construct a measure of worker skill by proxying for their skill by looking at the skill requirements of their current job. And so the assumption there is that if you're working in a job where these skills are important, we're going to presume that you have those skills. The OSTARnet database is going to consist of 35 different dimensions of skills, each rated on a scale from one to five. And this skill vector of occupations is going to consist of 10 basic skills, for example, reading comprehension and writing, four resource management skills, for example, time management, uh, six social skills, for example, social perceptiveness, three system skills, for example, judgment and decision-making, 11 technical skills, for example, equipment maintenance and computer programming, and a single complex problem-solving skill. This measure of skill has several attractive features. The first is that it adds dimensionality to the measurement of skills of workers that goes beyond this paradigm of equating degrees with skills or lack of degrees without skills. Secondly, this measure of skill is going to be equally applicable to workers with and without college degrees. It's also going to bear direct relationship on the nature of the tasks that workers are going to be engaged with at work. We also show in the paper that including these skills explains cross-sectional differences in wages just as well as including occupational fixed effects. And then finally, measuring skills this way is going to encode the reality that workers are able to both learn skills on the job that are transferable in terms of their wages. All right. When workers transition to an occupation that pays high wages, it's typically, it's typically going to mean that that worker is going to, sorry, it's typical that the, that the skill requirements in the destination job are going to be higher than the worker's current skill, regardless of whether that worker is a college, has a college degree or that worker is a star. In this plot, what we can what we show is the difference between the skills in the origin destination relative to the, the destination occupation. And so positive values are going to suggest that um, the skill requirements in the destination occupation are going to exceed the skill requirements in the origin occupation. And we can see that for workers who are who have bachelor's degrees, that's the unfilled circles, that for 27 out of the 35 skills, the skill requirements in the destination occupation are going to exceed the skill requirements that the skill, the skills that that worker has based on where they currently work. For STARS, this is going to be the case for 34 out of, out of these 35 skills. And so the headline is that for all workers, regardless of degrees who are making transitions to higher wage work, they're going to be taking a reach in terms of the skill requirements of this higher wage work, not just workers with bachelors, with not, not just workers who are STARS. What we then do is we're going to merge the OSTARnet data with data from the current population survey, which is going to allow us to observe job market transitions. 
And it's also going to allow us to observe the wages in a worker's origin job, as well as their destination job. For workers who make recent job transitions, we're going to use a Euclidean distance metric to measure the distance between their origin job and their destination job. There are other ways to measure it, but they're all going to be very highly correlated. And so this isn't going to affect our results substantively. The second thing that we're going to do is to define what's called the flow rate. And this is going to represent the number of observed transitions of workers from, the, from an origin I to a destination destination J divided by the number of workers in the origin occupation. So this is just a fraction of workers in a given occupation that are moving to another occupation. Finally, we're going to be focusing on a construct that we call the absolute skill mobility friction, which is going to measure the percent reduction in the flow rate for workers for a 1% increase in the skill distance between the origin and the destination occupation. Okay, let's see if I... Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Let me first start off by showing you some non-parametric plots of the relationship between the flow rate and the skill distance. Okay, in figure three, sorry, in, in figure A, you can see the you can see that the flow rate is going to be declining with the skill distance, and this slope here is going to be the absolute skill mobility friction. And so in principle, a one percent increase in the skill distance is going to reduce the flow rate by 1.1.4 a percent. We can also see that for workers making larger transitions, that the percent change in, in wages is going to be an increasing function of the, skill, of the skill distance between your origin and your destination occupation. So effectively, you get paid more as you move to, to occupations where the skill requirements are going to be higher. And so fundamentally, it's a question of opportunity in terms of who gets to move to those jobs. Importantly, the frictions that workers experience might be different depending on whether you're moving up the labor market or down in the labor market. And in principle, if you're moving up in the labor market, more friction is going to be a bad thing for, for upward mobility. Instead, if you're moving downward in terms of wages, this is a context where you actually want to have more friction to stop you from sliding down. And so we're going to disaggregate our transitions into transitions that lead to upwardly mobile wages, wage growth, and to downwardly mobile wage growth, and then estimate our absolute skill mobility frictions for these two cases and do that separately for workers with and without bachelor's degrees. In the left panel, we show you the relationship between the flow rate and the skill distance for stars. In the right panel, we show you the, the, the relationship between the flow rate and the skill distance for workers with bachelor's degrees. The filled in circles, the filled in triangles that are pointing downwards are going to capture the relationship for downwardly mobile transitions, whereas the open triangles that are pointing upwards are going to capture the relationship for upwardly mobile transitions. Focusing, on, focusing in on stars, what we can see is that the slope of this line, which is going to give us our absolute skill mobility friction, is a lot more negative for upward transitions than for downward transitions. And so what this is going to suggest is that the absolute skill mobility friction for stars is much higher when moving up in the labor market than when moving down. The opposite is the case for workers with bachelor's degrees, where you see, for example, the slopes of these lines for upward versus downward mobility seem pretty similar for these close transitions. But once we get to these far transitions, for workers with bachelor's degrees, they are going to be less likely to flow to, to lower wage work, so the skill mobility friction is negative. But for these far transitions, you actually see an uptick in this slope. And so in fact, for workers who have bachelor's degrees, they're more likely to flow to jobs when they don't have the skills required for those jobs. And it's going to be this fundamental gap here that's going to drive a lot of the, the labor market inequality that we're going to document in this paper. To give you a sense of the, of the model, we're going to analyze a worker's job mobility as a function of their current skills and the skills requirements for potential future jobs using a matching model. In the model, a worker originally employed in an occupation I is either going to remain in that occupation or is going to match to a different occupation J, depending on how much that occupation um, maximizes the value of the worker occupation match, which is a quantity that's going to depend on the average switching cost across all occupations, which is captured by this alpha zero parameter. It's also going to depend on index measures of the desirability of the origin and the destination occupations, uh, xi i and xi j, as well as Euclidean skill distance between uh, the origin and the destination occupation, dij. And finally, on an idiosyncratic taste term, um, epsilon i, which we are going to assume is given by type 1 extreme value distribution. 
When we solve the model, we get the following equilibrium relationship between the log of the flow rate and the skill distance and the desirability of the, of the origin and destination occupation. The intuition for this is the following. The better the origin occupation is, the less likely you are to flow, hence the negative sign. The better the destination occupation, the more likely you are to flow, hence the positive sign there. And this theta parameter here is gonna tell you how much friction does a worker face as a function of the skills distance between their origin and their destination occupation. So this structural parameter theta is gonna be what we call the absolute skill mobility friction, which is the percent decrease in the flow rate for 1% increase in the skill distance. And it's gonna be a slope parameter. Secondly, we're going to define the relative skill mobility, uh, the relative skill mobility friction, which is the difference between the absolute skill mobility friction for workers with college degrees and workers with workers who are stars. The key thing for you to remember as we move to the next set of figures is that if the relative skill mobility friction is positive, that's going to mean that stars experience more friction than, than workers with bachelor's degrees. If instead the RSMF is negative, that's going to mean that stars experience less friction than workers with bachelor's degrees. We're going to define an opportunity gap in the following way. If the RSMF is positive for upwards transitions, that's going to mean that stars face more friction than workers with bachelor's degrees when moving up in the labor market. If it's negative for downward transitions, that's going to mean that when they're moving downward, they're going to experience less friction than workers with bachelor's degrees. But when you're moving downward, that's exactly when more friction is going to be good. We're going to estimate a model where we just look at this homogeneously. We're also going to estimate a fully interacted model where we estimate our absolute skill mobility frictions by worker, by worker category, star versus worker bachelor's degree, and also by whether you're moving up or down in the labor market too. So this is gonna be the full specification. Okay. What I'm showing you now in this figure is the estimate of the relative skill mobility friction in the overall sample, in the sample with up versus down, and then up versus down interacted with whether the transitions are, are close or they're far. And so what's some of the headlines? The headline is the following. Our estimates of the relative skill mobility frictions show that stars experience more friction than workers with bachelor's degrees in upwardly mobile transitions. So this is the positive RSMF for upwardly mobile transitions, but less frictions when they're moving downward in the labor market. And a key driver of this is going to be for these far transitions. Remember from earlier in the talk where I showed you that when workers are moving up in the labor market, both stars and workers with bachelor's degrees are moving into jobs where the skill requirements for the destination job exceeds the skills that those workers have. And so this is exactly where the labor market inequality is occurring here. Okay. The fact that stars face relative more friction when moving up and less friction when moving down is unaffected by labor market conditions. In this figure, we show you results when we subset the data by labor market tightness, which we, where we define a tight labor market as a labor market in which the unemployment rate is at 10% or less. We still find that regardless of whether we're in a tight or a loose labor market, that the relative skill mobility friction in downward markets is going to be negative, right? If we're downward and loose or downward and tight for the labor market, it's still gonna be negative. Stars are going to face less friction moving downward. Likewise, when faced with upward mobility, stars in the loose and a tight labor market are gonna face more friction than workers with bachelor's degrees as evidenced by this positive relative skill mobility friction. And this is important because what this is saying is that it's not about differences in, in the business cycle impacts on, on workers with and without degrees. Um, oftentimes firms will require bachelor's degrees more during recessions than in times where the labor markets are tight, but we're seeing here that the labor market conditions are not driving uh, differences in our results here. The main concern with assigning a causal interpretation to our analysis is omitted variable bias. We simulate the impact of omitted variable bias on our relative skill mobility frictions for downward and upwardly mobile transitions, and we find that on average our estimates are going to be unbiased. And if there's any bias coming from omitted skills, we can bound it both above and below by about 10%. The key idea behind our approach is that we simulate omitted variable bias by re-estimating our model with 34 instead of 35 skills. And then we take the difference between the estimated parameters from the model with 34 skills versus the model with 35 skills to compute the percent bias. 
And then we can permute through all 35 skills to get a distribution of omitted variable bias for both downward mobility and upward mobility. And so that's where this is coming from. The, the last thing that we do is that all of the data that I've shown you so far was for the most recent 10 years. We take our method and we roll it back in time as far back as 1976. And the headline finding is that the opportunity gap that we documented in the most recent decade has also been persistent for the past four decades. We find that the relative skill mobility friction um, for upward transitions is positive, meaning that workers who are stars experience more friction going up in the labor market relative to workers with bachelor's degrees. And the relative skill mobility friction when moving to downwardly mobile wages has always been negative, meaning that stars face less uh, friction when moving downward in the labor market than workers with bachelor's degrees. In conclusion, we, we find that workers learn on the job and hence develop skills, that these skills predict labor market transitions for all workers. However, there is an opportunity gap when, skill, when, the, when the skills required are different from a worker's given skills, and in particular, when workers are moving to upwardly mobile jobs. And in particular, stars are gonna face more friction than workers with bachelor's degrees when moving to higher wage work. And so zooming back out and tying it in with the core idea of, of the panel, what we find is that measurement is really important. Measuring the skills of stars is really important for, our, for uncovering the opportunity gap um, as being a key driver of increasing labor market inequality. And this work is growing. We have a, a, an increasing research community of diverse scholars from many different fields who are interested in thinking about how can we drive more mobility for this population of workers who are skilled through alternative routes. And also to like, we're getting a lot more engagement from um, both folks in practitioners in the, in the workforce field, as well as corporate partners in terms of thinking more deeply about how they can change their hiring practices to be more inclusive. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, we are, you know, pu pushing up against the official end of the panel, but I think that um, uh, our panelists and, and certainly I'll be willing to stick around to field questions for uh, a while longer. So let's uh, open it up. Questions? Yeah, would you forgive if I interrupt for one second? No, go for it. Uh, given the uh, the nature of flows in and out of rooms uh, at the end of a conference, I, uh, I I just want to take a chance to thank the uh, extraordinary staff at, at HCEO uh, and with the uh, at, at the Q committee. Um, in particular, Carrie Cardoza has always uh, shows that she's uh, you know staggeringly kind and efficient. And uh, you know, couldn't, we wouldn't have worked without her on the one end. And the other end, I you know, I want us to single out uh, Trina Taylor, who is a temporary uh, a person for uh, uh, for the QM Quantitative Methods Committee because uh, uh, Asia Francis uh, is happily on maternity leave, and Trina, uh, literally, a beat was not missed, and so uh, things could not have gone more smoothly. So thank you all. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So with that in mind, again, as I said, I, I just wanted, I uh, was worried about the, the uh, terminal, the three o'clock deadline, but please. Uh. This is a, a, a question for Betsy. And, um, so um, you spoke at the end of your, at, of, of your talk, and thank you, by the way, very much for that. I am just as depressed hearing your talk as I was having read the paper. Uh, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it does point to lots of research opportunities, and that's the good news, right? So, so um, my question is about, about structural interventions um, that you spoke about briefly, briefly at the end. And um, you know, a, a, a paper that I liked a lot uh, a long time ago was written a long time ago by Larry Lessig, who we think of as you know, the electronic frontier front, so one of those electronic things. But, but he wrote a paper with the title of something like Law and Social Meaning. Um, and, and, and so in this paper, you know, he talked about, about how how law could reinforce um, social norms um, and law could bootstrap social norms, but law cannot diverge too far from social norms um, because otherwise, you know, we just disrespect the law. And furthermore, the effect of that disrespect in a particular instance could actually spread to other categories of law that we then begin to say, oh, that's stupid too. Um, and I suspect that the same thing actually must hold for opinion leaders, that, that, that opinion leaders um, don't really lead so much as they follow ahead. Uh, and if that's the case, you know, I, I, and I wonder, 
you know, um, does that really does does that idea really have a lot of legs? I mean, how how much how much how much the, the, you know how much uh, leverage do opinion leaders do things like Supreme Court decisions and stuff like that actually have in setting social norms? Is there research on this that talks about whether whether they're leading or following the pack? <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, I um, I definitely have a lot of thoughts on this, both from having to think about this from the paper that we did on the Supreme Court, um, but also um, uh, in some other lines of research in my lab, we do research on, on networks and, and opinion leaders within networks. And um, in, in networks, we're always looking for the people who are um, getting a lot of observation from others and, um, when we do interventions, when we find these people and, and uh, who, who, who have eyes on them all the time, um, one of the things that we are very careful to do in our interventions with them, trying to encourage them to very publicly um, adopt certain stance and, and certain behaviors is to not push them too far so that then they're rejected by their network. So, um, I, I mean, we share that intuition, although um, I think that it's more born of the experience of running these interventions. So, I mean, I can even give you just this like very um, uh, vivid example of working in a high school where uh, the opinion leaders of that high school were going to get on stage and, and do a skit. And I would say one of the more popular students um, in, in that group, um, because they're not all popular, but one of the more popular students in that group uh, literally just stood in the wings of the stage and waited for the skit to unfold for a few minutes, checking to see the audience's reaction before he walked out uh, to do it. And uh, he was sort of checking exactly this notion of, are we pushing this too far? Um, on the Supreme Court side, um, you know, that was also Ruth Bader Ginsburg's um, uh, prediction. And one thing that she reflected on uh, publicly about Roe v. Wade was that it was too far ahead of its time. And that's one reason why it was so easy for all of the pushback that it received uh, afterward. And, you know, a public opinion on, on abortion uh, plateaued at 50-50 uh, um, pro and anti after the passage of Roe v. Wade. Um, and so, uh, you know, she contrasted that with other things like loving, where uh, public opinion was on this sharp in terms of approval of interracial marriage, um, but it could also be applied to Obergefell. Um, and then in other cases, I think, you know, we're collecting new data on the Supreme Court and we find that some decisions, we're not quite sure of this yet. We haven't really pinned down this explanation, this mechanistic explanation at all, but we're just wondering, in some cases, there was an abortion case decided last summer that we were tracking, um, uh, you know, time series opinion toward. And our regression discontinuity actually shows that after this surprisingly favorable um, decision was passed down toward with respect to abortion, um, Americans in our sample were more likely to say that uh, the norms were anti-abortion in the United States. And so one idea potentially is that the law reminded them that, you know, oh, right, there's still <laughs> litigation going on against abortion, this reminds us of how, you know, anti-abortion uh, so much of the population is. So, so it's, um, it's certainly not an issue of people just moving in lockstep with whatever the opinion leader says. And I, I would tend to agree with the Lessig slash Bader Ginsburg uh, prediction, although I, I couldn't give you uh, rock solid evidence against that. For may, that. May I follow up with a question? Is it possible to identify different types of um decisions with respect to timing. And what I mean by that is um, uh, the loving law, um, it, you know, some of the laws were in place for a long time and then they were reversed, but in other cases, laws were implemented quickly and they were reversed. And so the example, this is gonna be an obscure example. Uh, California had a referendum that declared that, it, that anybody could sell their house to anybody they want. Literally, it was almost a one sentence and it passed overwhelmingly and the California Supreme Court threw it out immediately because it basically was legalizing discrimination. And so I guess it would be interesting to say, see cases where the public actually quickly uh, spoke in a majority sense in one direction, the court said no, and then see what the response was. Yeah, I, I, I love that idea. I think that this question suffers from a lack of uh, longitudinal data collected because I wouldn't in many, I, I think many scholars um, in most cases wouldn't expect opinion to follow from these decisions, um, that, that people's minds would be changed. What I find to be more um, uh, plausible and, and more sensible theoretically is that 
these decisions change what you think other people think. Like, what are what's the consensus? What's our public consensus here? And um, and social scientists just haven't been collecting that kind of data in the way that we're talking about it. Norms in that way. It's it's more uh, just a collection of public opinion. Um, do you believe in abortion? Do you believe in these kinds of residential and zoning laws and all these all these types of issues? So based on on, on uh, Betsy's response, because I've worked on that. There's a literature on the expressive effects of laws that looks at how whether laws could send, an, send a message about whether or not uh, we as a society hold a certain value that then people internalize and then that shifts the norms. So I've actually studied the effect of a very famous uh, anti-immigrant law that was passed in Arizona called SB 1070. And I wanted to understand if the passage of such high profile, such uh, uh, punishing uh, I immigration law could actually affect public opinion. And like Betsy said, it's very hard to find um, time series public opinion data especially because we do a lot of like, uh, you know, uh, cross-sectional one-shot surveys. So what I did is I relied on, on Twitter data in order to follow users in Arizona and see how they reacted, how, how they express themselves about immigrants, different kinds of immigrants before the law was passed and also after. And what I found and what I've, I've continued to find looking at the same question is that discourse did become more anti-immigrant after this high profile anti-immigrant policy was passed it did become more anti-immigrant your average tweet about immigration became more negative but the mechanism that drove that effect was um, not people changing their minds not people changing the way they talked about immigrants it was more about mobilizing people that already had anti-immigrant feelings they become more prolific on twitter so, so this mobilization uh, mechanism, I found also in other papers. I have another paper uh, looking at the effect on of uh, Trump. His, you know, his 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 inauguration speech, when he came famously came down from those golden elevators in the Trump Tower. He sort of broke the rhetoric at that point in the sense that at that point there was a Republican agreement not to talk about migration. Right. I mean, they were coming from the 2012 election. They had an autopsy report. They thought that by Romney being too harsh on immigration, talking about self-deportation, that had sunk the, 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 the prospects for Republicans. But Trump came in and it was a pretty nice exogenous shock, right? Basically said they're rapists, they're criminals, they're, you know, they're, they're committing all these crimes. So I used that regression discontinuity design because it just happened that a Gallup was on the field conducting a survey, so I was able to compare folks before they were exposed to the, before the date of the, the, of the speech and after. And I find essentially that there's a, there's a small negative effect, but it's mostly concentrated among Republicans and low educated uh, whites. Then I do have a number of survey experiments and I find that uh, just being exposed to these negative messages makes these folks that are already more conservative, that are more likely to express such views, more likely to express them, right? So, and then I follow up with them two weeks later after the intervention, and I find that the effect is gone. Essentially, what I find is that there appears to be a mobilization effect among people that already feel the same way. They, they just kind of feel like more of a license to express their views, but the effect is actually quite uh, short-lived. It goes away after a few days, it just dissipates. Another little treatment that I did is I varied who was making these statements, precisely to, to test these uh, long um, assumptions in the literature. And I said, a governor had made these statements, right? Versus just a random person. And I find no difference. It's just about the, 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 the sentiment in the message. That's what produced these uh, effects. I have a question for Michael. Um... So, I mean, you made a pretty convincing case that these differences and like callback rates by name are conflating a lot of different things. Um, I wonder if you have like any suggestions uh, for, you know, innovations in that particular type of research design for separating out the, the different types of discrimination that uh, people are interested in. Yeah, this is close to the standard question I get, which is, 
what names should I use <laughs> for my work? And uh, it's hard to know, right? Because I, I think that another thing that I'm interested in looking into, and I have some preliminary work on this as well, is how perceptions of these names also vary by the context of the decisions. So um, there's some work uh, from some economists that was published in ARA, I'm sorry, in um, AR a few years ago that, that looks at um, a related idea related that, that's called attention discrimination. And essentially it's about this, vaguely about this idea that um, we, you know, may pay more or less attention to these signals depending on who's sending the signals and what the context is. And I have a, I have a hunch that um, essentially for, uh, for Blacks in particular, there's not a whole lot that you might be able to do to override these social class signals um, with certain names because uh, the, the preliminary results suggest that they hold whether or not, you know, these are in, in audits where you're looking at people who have college degrees or audits of people who, who are um, uh, testing like low wage employment uh, markets where you maybe have a criminal record as well. And there doesn't seem to be much difference there in terms of you know, what, how the names are performing in different kinds of contexts. And that's pretty, I think that's very problematic because I, I don't, that doesn't seem to be true of whites, that there are certain ways that you can sort of escape at least the social class context by using different names or in certain contexts, it doesn't matter. And so, um, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that in terms of like, what's the, you know, if you were implementing an audit tomorrow, how would you do this? It's not super clear that there's actually a real way to do it. And in some ways, we, you know, maybe we shouldn't always try to isolate a single signal because that's not the way that the real world works anyway, right? That certainly the, if you have one of these names, that's what you're facing, right? So I, I think a better question is how can we make this kind of stuff more um, generalizable versus, you know, simply just saying, well, we're using these names and we're assuming that this is what racial discrimination is about. I, I think a better answer is that, you know, it, it seems that studies that, that use a wider variety of names are probably more generalizable in many ways. Um, but in the end, I mean, something that I didn't have a chance to touch on is it's actually a very low percentage of um, people in the United States that actually have these sorts of, well, for, for Blacks especially, that have these sorts of racially distinguishable names. I mean, for every Jamal Washington, you know, there's, there's five guys named Mark Smith who are also Black, right? And so um, uh, this is not, they don't have that same experience. Um, and it's a little unclear exactly at this point how we capture this, although, you know, perhaps we're just going to have to start faking a bunch of LinkedIn profiles and giving people cues in other ways. And um, we're, we may reach a point where these become less common again, like they were when they were in person and, and they're much more resource intensive to run. Mike? I, yeah, I, I felt very seen by your paper. I had an experience when I... <laughs> I, I grew up in the Bahamas, my first, this may be my second year in college. Um, as I was going into my dorm room, one of, the, one of the housekeeping staff looked at me and she said, Peter Blair, she said, when I saw that name, I thought you were gonna be a white boy. <laughs> and and I, as, you were, as you were talking about the measurement point, I wonder if there's scope to do something that would look like a hedonic regression in, in housing markets, where one were to regress, say for example, like, a name on like a name onto like how black is the name, how much does it signal social class, how much does it signal criminality and so on and so forth. And then when we start to think about a lot of these treatments, then we can look at how much of the outcomes are loading onto these different components of the name, right? And that may be, that may be a way to make progress on, on this question because I think you're absolutely right that the name is a bundle of, of goods that each individually contribute to whatever the outcome is based on what the name is collectively signaling. But then there may also be ways in which their interactions between these different um, these different components too, right? So with me, for example, like 
having a name like Peter Blair, which people think of as like a British white guy, um, it, it cuts in a lot of different ways, right? Because there are some people like, well, I didn't expect you to be black. And so now I mean to be to, to be black. And so now I interact with you in a, in a very like weird way, or, or maybe I interact with you in a more favorable way. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you're, you're certainly right. And the, the real problem we're running into right now is simply just a, a low in in terms of studies, right? That um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm, I'm think so we have collected data on almost 70 studies that look at white black discrimination in some way across contexts. And about 45 of those, I think we've been able to either download the original data uh, from a depository or directly contact the researchers and we've had success getting those. Most of what we can't get is simply because there are, there are significant IRB restrictions on a lot of these types of uh, studies. And so IRB is very hesitant to allow some of these researchers to provide us with data, even though they're completely hypothetical made up people, right? The fact that maybe you used, um, you know, Peter Blair as one of your examples, theoretically, you know, could be somehow linked back with other data to specific employers, which then starts a whole new um, layer of risks, right? And so what we do have is, a, is about 45, I think, studies where we've got the individual level name data and then, um, you know, among those 45, uh, some of those are only using, you know, two names, right? And so it's a small in overall where we're using within study fixed effects to, to try to wipe out a lot of the, the variance that's happening over uh, different characteristics. And, um, you know, it's, I, I've run some regressions with just the race perceptions. I've run some with the class perceptions and I've run some interacting both. And th there's something there for sure, but it's still a little early, I think, to make any strong statements about, you know, what's going on. And again, I mean, the the, the universe of names we're also dealing with is, um, I, I believe, you know, maybe 120 or so black names total um, that we have data for that we can do this. And so it's it's pretty limiting, to be honest with you, right now. But I'm hopeful. I, we have a couple of other things that are coming out of this meta analysis project um, first. And so I'm hoping that in the meantime, maybe we'll be able to collect some more data and, and move that part forward. I mean, it sure seems like uh, your idea of using like LinkedIn profiles or maybe even adding pictures of the hypothetical applicant um, to these resumes, which I think is becoming sort of more common, um, would definitely be one sort of low cost way to avoid some of these things but then you have to deal with all the stuff Renee was talking about how like just the particular faces you choose communicate a whole bunch of different factors um the real the real issue the stumbling block with LinkedIn that I've been trying to work on is the fact that it's hard to make a realistic LinkedIn profile um because you need these connections with other people you need a history there in the LinkedIn profile I mean it's easier, obviously, to do with with you know kids that are right out of college because it's 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 believable that they would make this you know in their senior year maybe they have, they don't really have strong reasons to have LinkedIn for much longer before they came to college at least and so there's you know it's possible I mean there's like websites where you can buy <laughs> you can buy fake connections you know but. Um, it's just I think it's a big startup cost and time involved to do this. So I am, I'm going to have to run, but that doesn't mean you guys can't continue to talk. I just wanted to thank the, the panel and all of you for uh, and uh, you know a, a wonderful meeting. And I have to thank Jeff uh, for, uh, for for organization, inspired thoughts on on who to speak and all of it. So thank you all.